parties of the 20th Conference of the UNCLOS, which is the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. In terms of education, he obtained his law degree from the University of Diplomatikro uh, Samarang in Indonesia, and excuse me if I mispronounced that, uh, in 1986, as well as his LLM at Harvard Law School in the United States. The lecture topic that he's chosen is quite an interesting one, uh, in particular in terms of where I see also the future of cultural diplomacy going. Uh, not just working where you have two countries who want to work together, two countries who are at peace, or two countries who have a, a let's say, a healthy relationship, but in particular, what do we do when there are conflicts? What do we do if we have cultures or uh, countries that are actually in conflict? Is there room, is there space for cultural diplomacy? So for many reasons, I think you're really hitting the nail on the head in terms of also where I see a huge potential for cultural diplomacy see in the future. The lecture title that His Excellency has chosen, Conflict Management and Resolution. Please join me again in a very, very warm welcome for His Excellency, Ambassador Arif Havaz uh, Ograzeno. So I well, thank you, Mark, for the kind words and uh, excellent presentations uh, of Ambassador Ismat uh, before myself. Um, I would like to define my short presentation into three elements. The first one is the Indonesian experience, and the second one is how our experience in cultural diversity shape our policy, and the third one is the next steps in uh, cultural diplomacy. Now, many of you, I believe, uh, know where Indonesia is uh, located, uh, but just to refresh your memory, Indonesia is in Southeast Asia. Uh, we are now 240 million uh, populations. And Indonesia it consists of uh, 17,508 islands. We are the largest archipelago in the world. And we have done an actual counting of our islands. So that 17,508 is actually the exact amount of islands that we have. Now, we have 200 ethnics in Indonesia, and we have 300 different languages, non ethnic languages, spoken in uh, Indonesia. Now, this is a gift, but also at the same time, this is a source of problems. And our founding fathers in 1900s, early 1900s, uh, they knew that the great diversity of Indonesia in terms of languages, in terms of ethnics, could become problems in uniting the country, but also could become an asset in uniting the country. So when they met in early 1900s to see how we can unite ourselves into one country with 200 ethnics and 300 languages, they decided that the national language of Indonesia is the language of the minority of the minority. It is the language spoken by very few people living in the coastal area, only in the ports. So it's a completely different approach uh, with many other countries where they use the language of the majority. In Indonesia, we, we, we have our national language, Bahasa Indonesia, which is actually not our language. Baza Indonesia is based from Malay, spoken by the majority in Malaysia and Brunei, and spoken only by very few people in the ports, in the ports of uh, Jakarta, in the ports of uh, Sumatra, but not spoken by people in the hinterlands at all. So this was decided uh, with a very clear rationale, which is the majority in Indonesia of those ethnic majority who speaks uh, the major language in Indonesia are forced to learn a new language, which become a national language. And in Indonesia, automatically we speak two languages. The language of our mothers, our mother tongue. I speak uh, Central Japanese language. I only know Indonesian language when I go to the elementary school when I was five years old. And uh, similar thing happens with uh, most of the ethnics in uh, Indonesia. So this was the, the uh, 
political thinking of uh, our uh, founding fathers. When we see uh, a diversity, when we see a different uh, languages and culture uh, in Indonesia uh, as more of an asset than uh, liability. Now, as you are well aware, Indonesia once uh, lived in a very authoritarian regime uh, up until 1998. In 1998, we had a political reform that came from a major financial crisis. If, if I look back in 1998 to Indonesia, uh, our economic growth in 1998 was minus 80%. Our stock market was contracted minus 40%. Our ratio of debt to GDP was 180%. We have 75% uh, unemployment. We have separatist movements all over the place. We have armed struggles, left and right. We have horizontal conflict from different ethnics. This is in 98. So if I look back in 98, I think for us, Greece is actually like walking in the park. Now, we manage our, our country uh, very painfully, lots of sacrifice, a lot of people died. Uh, slowly we managed to bring the country together. And today we are in a better position now. We are growing at 6.5% since the last five years. Our GDP is almost $1 trillion. We are the 17th largest uh, economy in the world. We are uh, a member of G20. And Indonesia is now the third largest democracy in the world. You know, we after the political reform, uh, we have elections at uh, all levels, at the presidential, national parliaments, regional parliaments, uh, local leaders, governors, mayors, you name it. We even have 62,000 of head, head of villages that uh, they have uh, to be elected through an election. So uh, these are the, the situations that we Face, uh, that we experienced in the past, and these are the situations of Indonesia today. The experience is very clear. Uh, culture it's, uh, it's a gift, uh, it's, a, it's a something that uh, becomes a strength uh, in a society, especially when you have a diversity of culture. But it could also become a problem uh, if you don't manage it uh, well, if you are not able to see. Uh, the commonalities in terms of how you approach uh, the issues. Now, with, with this uh, experience, I believe uh, we have so far, and my second point in terms of how our experience of cultural diversity shape our policy, is uh, making us able to, to uh, contribute in three areas. The first one, as a mediator in the uh, regional conflicts. The second one is to bridge with the often uh, difficult problem between Islam and uh, democratic principle of the West. And the third one becomes uh, a role that actually uh, Islam and democracy can live together. Uh, Indonesia is the third largest democracy. Uh, number one is India, number two is the United States, but we are the largest democracy with the largest Muslim population in the world. 85% uh, of Indonesians are Muslims, so we are looking at about 185 million Muslims in Indonesia, yet uh, we have a uh, market economy, we grow at nearly 7%, uh, we are a member of G20, and all of this uh, could become actually a model uh, for economic development or political systems uh, for our brothers and sisters in the North Africa and, and, and the Middle East. Now, 
the first element to, to play as a mediator role in the regional conflicts. Uh, Asia, as you are well aware now, is uh, where the, the economic power is. Uh, the Asian Development Bank uh, predicted that in 2050, the GDP of Asia will be 51% of the global GDP. In 2050, the U.S. will contribute about 15% uh, of the global GDP, and Europe will probably, according to ADB, somewhere around 18 to 19 percent of the global GDP. Uh, that is the prediction uh, in, in our part of the world. But to be to be comprehensive, also I think we, we need to be true to ourselves. There are so many conflicts in. in Southeast Asia, East, East Asia. Uh, one of them, uh, you, you probably have heard it uh, many times, is the South China Sea conflict. It's an overlapping conflict, uh, a sovereignty conflict of small islands and islands in South China Sea between China, China Taipei, uh, Brunei, uh, the Philippines, uh, Vietnam, and Malaysia. Uh, we actually see this as a potential of hotspots since the early 80s. And uh, Indonesia uh, took the initiative in 1990 to establish uh, an informal workshop on South China Sea. The informality is very important because uh, in Asia, I think uh, the Asian culture, sometimes people are reserved. Uh, people don't go say what they mean to say. They don't want to have a confrontations, and this type of uh, cultural background is uh, is an area whereby informality plays a very strong role. So that's why Indonesia approached the issue through uh, informal uh, workshop, informal meetings, informal sessions, what we call the the second track uh, diplomacy. Now. Uh, it has been working uh, so far so good. Uh, there has been 21 uh, workshops since 1990, and uh, the second track uh, results and developments are often transported into the first track uh, forum, which are able then to reduce tensions, to create uh, confidence, and also to maintain the peace uh, in the region. The second role of Indonesia on the basis of our uh, internal experience in managing conflict is if you recall the what they, what they call the, uh, the third Indochina war. This is the conflict between Vietnam, Cambodia, uh, and Laos in the 1980s. And um, Indonesia was uh, appointed as the interlocutor uh, between the warring uh, uh, parties. And in 1993, uh, we have what we call the Jakarta Informal Meeting, Jim. Uh, Jakarta Informal Meeting in Jakarta. We, we held as sessions with Vietnam, with Cambodia, with Laos, and uh, the resulting uh, process was the establishment of the United Nations Transitional Administrative Councils in uh, those three countries that finally brings the conflict uh, between Cambodia, Vietnam, and Laos to an end. And this country later on became part of ASEAN. The third one uh, was the mediating role that we played between the conflict of the Moro National Liberation Front, front uh, Muslim uh, organizations who was asking for independence in the Philippines. And um, in 1990s, uh, Indonesia was, was asked to become a mediator. And uh, we, we uh, held a number of informal sessions again, uh, bringing into account the, you know, the typical culture of Asian people. Uh, and, and the informality of the sessions uh, finally made it possible for the Philippine government and the Moro National Liberation Front uh, to sign an agreement uh, 
to end the conflict uh, between them. Now, the second one is uh, in the in the in the in the bridging role between Islam and, and the West. Uh, we have done a number of uh, activities, uh, interfaith dialogue, uh, here in Europe. Uh, we have uh, brought about a number of imams uh, from Indonesia, a number of uh, Hindu leaders, Catholic leaders, and also Christian leaders uh, to come in a group, uh, to go to Europe to have discussions, uh, to see how the practices of different religions uh, in Indonesia as being observed. Now, I would like to give you a small example of, of, of uh, the practice of religions in Indonesia that makes it a bit different with the others. Uh, we, have a, we, have a, we have a habit that if, a, if someone is pregnant for one month, three months, seven months, then we have a ceremony. This is Hindu which probably come from Buddhism, which probably come pagan, we don't know, but it's there in our culture. So if you are a Muslim, uh, you have a, you know, you, you, you read Quran uh, in this ceremony. But if you're not Muslim, you still do the same thing. You still do the same ceremony one month, three months, seven months, but you do it with the uh, prayer of another religion. So it's very interesting. This is, this is not the Middle East type of practice. I have not seen this in the Middle East. Uh, I've seen this only in my country. Uh, there are a number of uh, practices in Indonesia uh, which uh, became, uh, in, 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 many, in, in many of our people's view, is, uh, is Islamic, which is actually, you don't find it in the Middle East. So uh, this is what our religious expert says, not what I said. Uh, the indigenization of Islam in Indonesia. And I recall when the, one of them came to Brussels, to European Parliament, to launch a book together with a member of European Parliament. It's a very interesting book. You can, you can download it from the internet. It's, it's very thought provoking. It's called The Illusion of Islamic State. It's, it's a very interesting book. The book was written in Indonesian language initially, and it was so successful that uh, people would like to have them in English. I think it's already online in English. Uh, it was made by the largest Muslim organizations on earth. It's Tahladul Ulama and U. It has 40 million membership. It's an NGO, an Islamic NGO with 40 million uh, memberships. And they work with uh, an NGO from Washington to, 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 to translate this book, The Illusion of Islamic State. This book basically told uh, the thinking that when Prophet Muhammad uh, established a state, he did establish a Medina state, a civilized state, not Islamic state. This is what what is basically uh, the professor was saying over there. So this is our experience that we would like to share, and we did share uh, you know, with, with, with colleagues in, in Europe, including uh, the launching of uh, this book. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Indonesia and UK, we established what we call the Indonesia United Kingdom Imam Exchanges. We, we, we exchange imams from UK, uh, to Indonesia and vice versa. And uh, we have done a similar thing with the countries in Eastern Europe and uh, Russia especially, they would like to have uh, more imams from Indonesia going to uh, Russia and stay in this day. Now, the third one uh, is, uh, is a model probably uh, that we can share with our colleague uh, brothers and sisters in Egypt and in Tunis. Uh, we have an institution called the uh, Institutes of Peace and Democracy. This is an under uh, organized under an event called the Bali Democracy Forum. Now, we are not going out and lecturing. Uh, we are going out and sharing with colleagues uh, uh, how we did it in 98. 
how we end an authoritarian regime of 35 years. Uh, we pretty much quickly stopped them. Um, a lot of sacrifice, but uh, you know, with the result that we have today, uh, it was something that worth uh, doing it. And uh, we shared the experience with uh, with a colleague from from North Africa. We actually invited uh, experts. Uh, we, we invited Indonesian experts and politicians to go to Egypt and Tunisia, you know, to share with them uh, how we did it. Also, mechanically speaking, uh, how did Indonesia manage to to have the elections, uh, the free and fair elections in 1999, after such a long lull of, uh, of, of free elections? Uh, under the authoritarian regime. Uh, we continue our discussions uh, with many number of uh, 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 colleagues from across, across the world. And actually, uh, tomorrow on the 7, 8, and 9th of December, we have the Bali Democracy Forum in Bali. Uh, again, it's a forum uh, where we invite everybody uh, to have an exchange of view, not lecturing, but sharing. Uh, how you practice democracy in different parts of the world and how we Indonesians manage uh, to have a transition from an authoritarian regime into a democratic system that we have today. Now, the last part uh, of my short presentation is next steps. You see, we have a lot of discussions uh, on cultural diplomacy, we have discussions on interfaith dialogue, but I think what is missing is uh, specific projects. We need to have, uh, in my view, much more specific projects uh, that, would, uh, that would become the realizations of the, this ideal of uh, discussion on cultural diplomacy and interfaith dialogue. Uh, what I mean by specific projects, for instance, uh, Small thing, you know, the Americans have peace corps in the old days. Uh, I don't know whether they do it again or not, maybe not, I'm not so sure. But you can have maybe humanitarian corps. You know, you have a commission on humanitarian issues, uh, human rights, democracies, humanitarian aid, it's one of the strengths of the European Union. And, uh, you can bring in uh, you know young Europeans to go around the world for maybe you know specific time for six months one year you know to, to, to stay in a typical area maybe or not uh, I don't know but the idea is to have you know uh, someone going from European Union at a young age uh, to to be able to interact and you know mingle with uh, people around the world and uh, curriculum exchanges of curriculum, especially when we are talking about uh, interfaith uh, dialogue. It is very important also to understand how curriculum must be made in different parts of the world. You know, in Indonesia, the curriculum of, uh, in the curriculum of uh, many of the madrasa of the Islamic school, uh, we bring in priests from Christians and Catholics, uh, priests. They would go to madrasa they would tell uh, how, how it is in different religions, how, how are the similarities between Islam and, and the Christianity. And uh, we also bring uh, Hindu priests to go to uh, Islamic school and vice versa. In the Islamic university, you have a uh, professor from different religious background uh, giving courses on uh, you know, different uh, subjects of religion. So I don't know whether this is being done here in Europe or not, uh, but uh, you know it is something that we can have in exchange in terms of uh, in terms of how uh, we can can have a look at the uh, curriculum of Islamic school and madrasa. Uh, we have an element in the madrasa curriculum and Islamic curriculum, uh, Islamic school curriculum on the diversity. Uh, on the respect of tolerance, and this is something that uh, we have been uh, doing it uh, in a while. Um, exchanges of religious leaders uh, would be another substantive uh, element of activities uh, that could, uh, you know, be promoted. Uh, another 
one would be a study or research on the compilations and comparative studies in conflict management in different uh, cultures uh, here in Europe and also in many parts of uh, the world. So I think uh, I would like to close uh, by saying that uh, we need to, go, to move forward uh, with uh, cultural diplomacy, with interfaith uh, dialogue but uh, with much more specific projects, with much more uh, element that people can actually see uh, on the ground. Because otherwise, if not, uh, you, know, you, will, you, you will be having a discussions among the political elite, but we all know how important it is uh, in terms of uh, having a cultural and interfaith dialogue, but that is not being translated and trickled down uh, to the situations on the ground. Thank you very much. Your Excellency, thank you very much. Um, in many ways, I couldn't agree more. We actually just finished a black seminar at the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy in Berlin, looking at religion and cultural diplomacy. Uh, and I agree, I think, uh, in many ways, obviously, religion has been the cause uh, of many conflicts. It's it increased the, the conflict potential in many situations. However, I really do believe the potential is there for, as you were saying, such an interfaith dialogue. I think there, if we're serious about building trust and also building reconciliation, uh, I think sometimes by looking into our own faiths, as diverse as they are, uh, can sometimes bring some of the answer answers. So I think there, for me, the glass is half full uh, uh, as well. So now, thank you very much for those, uh, those comments and reflections. Uh, I'd be happy to take some questions and comments. I'm talking about Indonesia as well. By talking about the cultural diplomacy and cultural issues, in most of the conferences and events which I attended, in most of the speakers they raised the issue regarding China, regarding Indonesia, regarding Vietnam, and even in India about India as well. And I got a lot of information about it, Indonesia to from this conference. Since the I have one question for you, a specific question for you. Since the transitional period of 1998 to the day. What is the most prominent issue that you noticed related to culture that assists Indonesia to reform into the current culturally, politically, and financially advanced Indonesia? Yes. Uh, first of all, since uh, Afghanistan is uh, have their own culture, tradition, and religion, the few of the neighbor countries are interfering in their cultural and uh, traditions and religion, they are investing through the uh, non-governmental organizations, NGOs, uh, they are establishing their madrasas, uh, they are establishing their universities, they are establishing their schools to make common their tradition, their religion, and their culture, and to finish the Afghanistan real culture. Uh, we are very thoughtful about this, how we can civilian stop this prevention and make common our tradition and our culture. Uh, my another question is based on the uh, speaking. Uh, the majority of Afghanistan, more than 70% of the Afghanistan are Pashtuns national, and they speak Pashto. Uh, but in the real life, if you will go to the, any governmental offices, ministries, directorates, universities, uh, the national language is Dari, which is the language of almost 15% of the population, uh, which is not fair. If you are loading our voice and we are telling for, to the people that is not right, they are telling us the fascists and nationalists. Recently, we started a new movement by the name of Pashtun Movement, where we are trying to inform the youth, Pashtun youth, to work for their language and for their own traditions. What do you think about and how do we, you will judge our this uh, movement from the cultural and uh, diversity aspects? Thank you. Danny from France, Danny Leblon from France. So, Indonesia has stated foreign policy objective of establishing stable, fixed land and maritime boundaries with uh, all of its neighbors. Some section of borders along Timor remain unresolved. Could you give us some concrete example of how you use cultural diplomacy to achieve that kind of situation? Ambassador, you mentioned the initiative taken by Indonesia to set up a workshop to mediate or to discuss uh, issues of, of uh, sovereignty in East Asia and Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. 
And as now we all see that China is building up his, its uh, military might, how do you uh, think that a further um, process to, to, can lead to, to other solutions? Uh, the first question from Colin from Nepal. Uh, I think the most uh, pressing uh, cultural issue that we face today actually is uh, the trend of the younger generations to be very individualistic. This is unfortunately you know, how things are uh, in Indonesia. It's probably a result of the uh, modernization. Uh, and also we start to see the younger generations moving away from some traditional you know, practices. It may be good, it may be bad. We, we do not know uh, how to gauge it in the future. Uh, but uh, we are looking at uh, the younger generations now, which is I think 60% of the Indonesian population are between 15 years of age to 50 years. And uh, they will uh, basically in one generation in 2050 uh, be able to, 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 to bring Indonesia to its directions. Uh, uh, we hopefully become a developed nation by this time. But uh, the concerns are there. The, 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 the other concerns is the, uh, the culture in terms of uh, we still have a very strong uh, culture of tolerance. Okay? And, uh, but we are looking at also, uh, to be frank, uh, some extremists, you know. Uh, in the past, the uh, authoritarian government was very easy to deal with extremism. You know, figuratively speaking, those who have different opinions than the government would just simply put them in a container and send them to sea. You know, but today, we are a democracy. We have to entertain those ideas. Uh, sometimes it's not very easy. Uh, but we are learning, we are learning slowly uh, how we deal with extremists uh, in Indonesia, which we have never seen before in the old days, or maybe it was there, but it was suppressed. Uh, and this is uh, an element that it's, it's, it's also something that uh, you know, we are uh, very concerned. And this brings to the questions of uh, your questions about uh, curriculums, about uh, NGOs. And that is, that is why we, we have uh, a strong role, uh, because it's, in a democracy, I think the government cannot dictate uh, uh, what is the theological aspect of uh, religious teaching. So we empower the NGOs, we empower the grassroots uh, uh, organizations. The government simply have a discussion with them in trying to bring about curriculums. Uh, a national curriculum that include tolerance, a national curriculum that uh, take into account the diversity of uh, different uh, cultural religions in Indonesia. So this is something that we are trying to instill in a different way. You know, in the past it was easier because it was authoritarian. Uh, today, because it's democracy, then we have to do it in a different way, in a smart way. And I think we are we are having uh, a results, a positive results of that. Uh, there are a number of uh, civil society uh, in Indonesia, uh, Islamic civil society, as well as uh, the other civil society coming from different uh, religions. And uh, we, we, what I mean, we is the government and the Ministry of Religious Affairs uh, provides uh, general guidance uh, for all of this. Uh, organizations uh, for them to, 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 to flourish, to develop, but within a certain parameter of, uh, of tolerance. Now, um, language, it's, I think, is very critical, it's politically very explosive, and uh, it's very difficult for me to be frank, to gauge, or to give an assessment, you know, how is the linguistic movement uh, in, in Afghanistan. Uh, but I think as long as whatever linguistic movement that you have, uh, it's still contained in, in, in the unity of the nation, that is fine. Uh, in Indonesia, what we see 
today is that because people are afraid of losing the mother tongue, okay, and this is one of the cultural uh, threats, you know, that, that our parents are looking at. I mean, I cannot read the I speak the Central Japanese language, but there are special characters uh, of Central Japanese which I don't read. I cannot read anymore. It's not there in the school when, when I was there. Uh, now we have seen the local schools uh, giving courses on this uh, old script. Central Japanese is Sanskrit, so the character is almost the same with the you know, Sanskrit characters in, in, South, in South, South Asia. Uh, as long as that is part of the expression, it's okay, I think. You know, and it's, all, it, it's within the context of uh, unity. Uh, maritime boundaries and land boundaries. You know, I happen to be the, the chief negotiator uh, on land boundaries with East Timor, and my counterpart was uh, Nelson Santos, and he is now the East Timor ambassador here in Brussels. So you know, a good friend of mine, all the way back from Indonesia to Brussels. Uh, there are some enclaves in the land boundaries that uh, we think it's difficult. To resolve because of the cultural issue, especially in the angle of Waikusi, whereby uh, in the old days before European came, uh, there were one kingdoms. Uh, even today, they have their grandfather, their uncle, uh, their niece, whatever, across the border. So, uh, culture plays a very important role. That's why in our negotiations with East Timor, we, we embedded in the 1995 agreement, Article 6, I still remember that, uh, an element of the local cultures, the element of the respect for the livelihood and the culture of the local people. So in a way, what we are looking at in the future is what we call the soft border management. So the area is designed only for the local people, so they can perform their uh, cultural activities, their rituals in that particular spot. Mm -hmm. And uh, for administrative purposes, we can give some, you know, uh, ID cards of, or something like that for, for the local people to be able to, to use an area together. So this is one of the things in terms of culture that uh, can actually solve a very difficult boundary issue. The rise of China. The rise of China uh, is a very interesting uh, topic. I think uh, it's very interesting in, in, in a global regional context. You know, uh, Secretary Hillary Clinton wrote a very interesting piece in the journal uh, Foreign Policy last last November. Uh, the, art, the title of Hillary Clinton's article was "America's Pacific Century." And according to the United States, the world politics is going to be decided in Asia. And the U.S. wants to be in the center of it. And uh, Hillary Clinton is already visiting uh, Asia eight times. And we hope Madame Aston would do the same thing. She was not yet in Asia. Uh, President Obama has been in Asia three times, and uh, twice to Indonesia already. And just uh, last November, uh, we had the East Asia Summit. This is a summit uh, of the head of states of, of ASEAN, Australia, New Zealand, China, Korea, Japan, the US, and Russia. Uh, this is the only forum outside Security Council when you have a three permanent member of Security Council, US, China, and Russia, sit at the table discussing about regional security. And this is the only forum where four nuclear powers, India, Russia, China, and the US, all sit in one table discussing about uh, global security issue and regional security issue. Now, the arms race, if you will, in East Asia is arms 
unfortunately, you know, not only with, with, with each other, everybody is buying arms. We buy arms, we, we increase our defense uh, spending. But not so much actually, if you're coming from the region, if not so much actually uh, for a containment policy, no. But it's, it's the new threats, the new kind of threats that we face today. Um, terrorism, piracy, arms robbery and ships, uh, illegal fishing, drug trafficking, uh, people smuggling, people trafficking. These are all the new kind of threats. And if you look at the map in East Asia and Southeast Asia, uh, most of all the territories are waters. I mean, Indonesian territory, uh, we have land, which is only about 2 million square kilometers. Our maritime territory is 6 million square kilometers, and, and you know, we need large navy. Uh, we are probably the largest naval country in Southeast Asia. We have about 110 uh, uh, naval ships, but it's not enough. Uh, every year, we lost $30 billion to illegal fishing. So I heard the debate in the European Union about illegal fishing, but in, in our parts of the world, in Indonesia, illegal fishing is a big, big problem. So uh, arms rates are not actually uh, for the containment. Okay. Now, having said that, though, um, still people feel concerns on the rise of China and how it's being perceived. And um, I think the economic development in East Asia in Southeast Asia can be maintained if we are able to establish peace. Now, without having peace and stability, it's very difficult for us to, to have uh, uh, economic development as you see today. So therefore, Indonesia is taking initiative uh, you know, to take all different uh, conflict management uh, in the regions, uh, which involves you know, many different uh, players in the regions. Uh, the East Asia Summit is, uh, is a summit uh, which, which is centered in ASEAN, uh, also an attempt uh, by the ASEAN country to create peace and stability in the region. So I think both at the, the bilateral level, through the second track, to the informal level, as well as the uh, regional and global level, you see different kind of uh, infrastructure architecture for security in the region. It seems overlapping, it seems so many, it seems like noodle balls, but actually that is with, it is designed like that in order to create a regional integration, which is wide, not deep. The EU is very deep, we don't want to go to that direction, we want to go only to wide uh, uh, integration. Thank you so much. Okay, please express our gratitude once again for his excellent Thank you.